It is the Sengoku Jidai. Besieged and surrounded by his enemies, a lord pays a group of men to see his only child to safety. But do they have the skill to ensure her safety? And can they even be trusted? For this is an age of honor and treachery, of blood and valor, of gold and steel. Now available at Amazon, Smashwords, and at StudioBrainstorm.net. Links in the description. Welcome to the Chronicle of the Black Sword. Now begins the tale of Elric, proud prince of ruins who bore the Black Sword. Elric of Melnibene, the Eternal Champion, the White Wolf, the Albino Emperor, Kinslayer, Woman Slayer, the Pale Prince of Ruins, 428th Ruler of Melnibene, and the last of the Royal Line of the Bright Empire. Hated exile by both his own people and the Folk of the Young Kingdoms, Bearer of the Black Sword, one of the last of the Dragon Lords of Imrir, once a ruler, now a mercenary and a sorcerer. Tied by ancient ancestral pacts to the Lords of Chaos in general, and Ariok, Lord of the Seven Darks in particular, but by grim fate and the will of the cosmic balance, a servant of law in the eternal struggle. A tormented soul who seeks time and again to assert that he is in fact the master of his own destiny, 
only to be brutally reminded over and over again that he is little more than a pawn in the hands of powers he barely understands. He desperately seeks peace, knowing that he will never truly achieve it. He both desires and is terrified of love and intimacy. A man who, when possible, tries to do good, only to find his noble intentions constantly thwarted. By fate, by circumstance, by his enemies, or by his own weapon, Stormbringer, a soul-sucking rune blade that he both hates and needs, who grants his weak and sickly frame strength by devouring the souls of his enemies, but takes a special delight in consuming the souls of those whom Elric loves. Originally deemed by his own creator to be a simple one-off story, only to become so popular that he would eventually become a key fundament of the Moorcock multiverse. This video is about the world of Elric, such as it is, and it is about the character of Elric, such as he is. There actually isn't going to be that much lore involved because mostly Elric was written in short story form, and obviously it's a format that doesn't allow much for world building. Writers have to focus more on the plot and character. Also, because I would like to use this video to introduce the character of Elric to new readers, I'm not really going to go too in-depth into the character's fate. The only things I'm going to spoil are the Master of Chaos, because it depicts one of the few historical events of note in Elric's world, and the Dreaming City, the very first Elric pulp, because it is essential to establishing what kind of a hero, or anti-hero, Elric is, and what kind of a world and what kind of a destiny he has to face. Let us begin with Elric's people, the ancient, non-human elder race known as the Melnibineans. There is no set origin for the Melnibineans, again, mostly because when Moorcock wrote his stories, he was more interested in character and theme than world-building. One story claims that the Melnibineans are descended from an even older race known as the Vadak, who were driven from their plane of existence by the followers of Chaos. Another source claims that they came from the same ancestry as their famous venom-spewing dragons known as the Fawn, which explains why the Melnibineans are able to control them in battle. Melnibinean dragon riders make their first appearance in the Dreaming City in 1961, six years before Anne McCaffrey popularized the idea with the dragon riders of Pern. If you want to be really technical about it, you could say that the first Dragon Riders are technically the Ring Wraiths from Lord of the Rings, but Tolkien had very specific definitions of what a real dragon was, and he himself didn't consider them to be dragons. Still another origin story claims that the Melnibineans are descended from a group known as the Eldren, a race that features heavily in the story of the eternal champion Ericose. And just like the Melnibineans, the Eldren too have close ties with dragons. Whatever their origin, the people that eventually became the Melnibineans arrived in the world that would come to be known as the Land of the Young Kingdoms, although that appellation came much, much later. Long before the ancestors of the Melnibineans came to this world, the world of the Young Kingdoms was mostly unformed. There was a small but steadily growing patch of stable reality surrounded by the ever-swirling mass of pure chaos. The Lords of Law obviously wanted to put a stop to that, but, as per the rules of the Cosmic Balance, they were forbidden from direct interference. And so instead, they worked through a mortal agent, the Sorceress Michella. Establishing a magical fortress known as Canaloon at World's Edge, essentially wherever the stable reality of the world met the boiling mass of chaos, she would set up traps and supernatural tests for any warrior who dared to try and take Castle Canaloon. Those who managed to keep not only their lives, but also their sanity, she would send forth to conquer the stuff of chaos. As per the rules set up by the Cosmic Balance, when mortal man chooses to impose order upon chaos, chaos must submit. And so, Michelle's successful chosen champions would go forth, literally ordering chaos into new parts of stable reality creating peoples and entire landmasses out of the nothingness and formlessness of chaos. The most successful of these was Earl Obeck of Malador, champion and consort to the Queen of Clant. By the time the ancestors of the Melnibineans arrived, the world of the Young Kingdoms had been mostly rendered stable. Its geography comprised of a massive ocean, 
a few islands, and four fair-sized continents. It was on the southwestern continent, near the part of the ocean known as the Boiling Sea, that these ancestors settled down and made their first home. For the most part, these ancient ancestors were a peaceable people, wanting nothing to do with the affairs of magic or the gods. But the lords of the higher worlds were very much interested in the affairs of this world, and one day decided that this little city of the proto melnibonean people was where they would meet the lords of law and the lords of chaos to decide the rules as to how they would contest for control of the world. The messenger sent to inform the proto melnibonaeans of this development was Ariok, Knight of the Swords, Lord of the Seven Darks, Keeper of the Two Black Swords. He informed the people that they should leave their city, as the sight of the Lords of the Higher Realms was not something for mortal eyes to look upon. Terrified by this announcement, most of the people did indeed leave, and their abandoned city was forever after known as Erlin Karen A'a where the High Ones meet. Only one man defied this command, and when the Lords of the Higher Worlds caught him spying on him, they cursed him with eternal life and to never leave the bounds of the city, naming him ever after Josui Karelin Rare, the creature doomed to live. Meanwhile, the rest of his people crossed the sea and eventually found a small island to inhabit, which they named Malnibene. Many cities were built on this island and others, but the greatest of them all was their capital, Imrir the Beautiful, Imrir the Dreaming City, a city of beautiful, graceful towers, each a different color. And in the grandest tower of all, carved from a single massive gem, would be the seat of Melnibonean power, the Ruby Throne. However, exile from their old homeland was not the last the Melnibonaeans would hear of the Lords of the Higher Worlds. At some later undetermined point in their history, Ariok, Lord of Chaos, offered to be their patron. In those days, there were only two Melnibonean cities, Imrir, of course, and the second city of their nascent empire, Huhuishan. Imrir was in favor of an alliance with Ariok, while the people of Huhuishan opposed it, and so a brutal three-day civil war was waged. By the end of it, Imrir was left in ruins and needed to be rebuilt, but all the people of Huhuishan who had opposed the alliance with Chaos were put to the sword. Henceforward, the Nalnibonean race was bound to the service of Chaos, with Ariok as the personal patron of Melnibonae's imperial line. At one point in Melnibonae's history, he even bestowed upon certain emperors the two black swords, Stormbringer and its sister, Mornblade. These two horrific weapons were wielded by the sorcerer emperors of Melnibonae, both in the service of chaos and in the service of its own ambitions of conquest. A magically adept race, the Melnibonaeans not only made pacts with the forces of chaos, but also with many other supernatural entities and spirits the great archetypal beast lords of birds, of cats, lizards, and so on. But perhaps the most important packs were with the spirits of the four great elemental lords, fire, water, earth, and air. With all these supernatural alliances and resources at their command, the Melnibonaeans became a race of conquerors. It has been an abiding mystery how this once peaceful people of former refugees became arguably some of the greatest tyrants that the world of the Young Kingdoms would ever know. Some speculate that this transition began when they chose to accept the patronage of Ariok. Others insist that the transition began earlier, on that fateful day when the Lords of the Higher Worlds chose to meet at Erlin Karen A'a. This brief and tangential contact with the Lords of the Higher Worlds, so the theory goes, persuaded the Melnibonaeans that there was nothing of value to morality, that all that mattered in the multiverse was raw power. It would certainly help explain why the Melnibonaeans became what they ultimately became. At the height of the Bright Empire's power, the most charitable thing you could say about the average Melnibonaean was that he was, at best, amoral. As it happened, very few would be inclined to be charitable to the sons and daughters of Melnibone. With mastery of the supernatural came arrogance and the desire for imperial conquest, and with amorality came decadence, moral degeneracy, 
and sadistic cruelty beyond the dreams of mortal men. After their mastery of sorcery, Melibene's greatest asset was its dragons. Known as the Fawn, these dragons do not breathe fire per se, but rather spew a combustible venom that ignites on contact with the air, achieving essentially the same result. The human folk of this world had no defense against monsters that could fly higher than their castle walls and rain fiery death upon them from above. Of course, the metabolism of the fawn is such that they must often sleep years for every minute of wakefulness. But that was little obstacle to Melnibonean conquest. The humans could not challenge this elder race on land or by sea. Their fleets no match for Melnibonean's armada of golden battle barges. The tiered decks of each one teeming with archers and catapults capable of launching combustible materials from great distances. There is only one recorded instance of Melnibonean conquest being hindered, and that was against the great city of Quajasat, a city whose inhabitants were said to equal the people of Melnibone in malevolence and ambition. During the course of the war between Melnibone and Quajasat, a sorcerer on the latter's side attempted to use a mighty spell to destroy the invading dragon emperors and their armies. But the spell went wrong, reducing all the land around Quajasat into a great waste of sand known ever after as the Sighing Desert. Only the city itself remained unharmed, and while the Quajasati would convince themselves that this mighty spell destroyed their terrible enemy, in reality, the Empire simply abandoned its attempt to take Quajasat, deciding that the land, now a desert waste, simply wasn't worth the taking. From sea to sea, from continent to continent, the power of Melnibone spread and cemented itself. There simply was no one that could challenge them. Imrir itself, the capital of the Bright Empire, was utterly inviolate, defended at all times by its dragons, its fleets, its sorcerers, and a great stone maze built into the cliffs surrounding the island of Melnibone itself. Imbued with powerful sorcery, the maze would shift on the command of its emperor, so that any invading fleet would find itself hopelessly lost and at the mercy of the defenders. In the end, what brought about the decline of the Melnibonean Empire was the Melnibonean people themselves. Their dominance assured, with the passing of generations, they became more and more insular and inward-looking, more concerned with their own fleeting degenerate pleasures than the affairs of their empire. And so, through sheer negligence and navel-gazing, Melnibonean's grip over the lands of the young kingdoms loosened. In the vacuum left by the decline of Melnibone, the eponymous Young Kingdoms finally arose into being, initially as tributary states of the Empire, but as its decline continued, the Young Kingdoms eventually became fully autonomous and independent, and the Melnibonaeans simply didn't care. It wasn't as though these upstart lesser races had any hope of actually threatening them. They still had their dragons, and their fleets, and their sorcery. Even if all the world was lost to them, Melnibone and Imrir especially remained inviolate. In the northwest arose the kingdoms of Tarkesh, Darjur, Jarkor, and Shazar. Also the land of Mirn, whose folk evolved not from the same ancestors as humanity, but from entirely different stock. For the men and women of Mir bore great feathered wings upon their backs and could fly as the birds fly. In the northeast arose states far less martial and mighty than those of the northwest, but more interested in trade and thereby more prosperous. On the western coast of this continent arose Vilmir and Ilmiura. Across the water to the south and east lay the Isle of the Purple Towns, a small but daring kingdom of merchant princes, equally able in trading in blood as well as gold. To the north of Ilmiura lay this world's incarnation of eternal Tanalorn, haven for those weary of war, and safe haven from the machinations of law and chaos alike. Further inland lay the once great city of Quarjasat on the border of the Sighing Desert, the small kingdom of Karlak beside the Weeping Waste, Nadsokor, the so-called Beggar City, haven of all scum and villainy throughout the Young Kingdoms. Across the Weeping Waste itself lay the unmapped east, where lay kingdoms as barely understood as Elware and Foom. Directly south across the sea and past the Isle of the Purple Towns 
lay the kingdoms of the South, large, arrogant, decadent nations whose overweening pride often outstripped their actual potency, boasting such puffed-up states as the kingdoms of Picarade, Lormir, Yu, and Oin. In the twilight years of the Bright Empire, only one state posed a potential threat, even if the Melnibonaeans never saw it as such. The island of Pantang, populated and ruled by a race of human sorcerers almost as infamous as the Melnibonaeans themselves in terms of both sorcerous might and moral depravity. The Pantangians both hated Melnibonae and sought to emulate her sorcerous might and glory. To the Melnibonaeans, of course, Pantang was just another upstart nation. Its rulers, for all their depravity and vile evil, were only human. They could never hope to plumb the depths of darkness and degeneracy that the scions of the Bright Empire had achieved centuries ago. They had ruled the world for 10,000 years unchallenged. Even now, as insular and degenerate and disinterested as they'd become, there could be no possible threat posed to them by any of the young kingdoms. No. Once again, Milnibene's undoing could only ever have come from within. Enter Elric, son and only child of Emperor Cedric the 86th, despised by his imperial father from the moment of his birth, for in doing so, he killed Cedric's wife, the only creature the emperor had ever loved. This in itself was unusual, as Melnibonaeans, or at least most of them, didn't really think much of love, or really even understand it. But Cedric did, and, because his wife died, he never forgave his own son. The only reason that Elric even became emperor at all was the fact that Melnibonean tradition decreed the son succeeds the father, and Cedric valued the traditions of his people far more than he hated his sickly albino heir. To understand Elric and his place within the fantasy genre as a whole, one must look, of all places, to Robert E. Howard and Conan the Barbarian. If Moorcock is indeed worthy of being rated among the greatest and most influential writers in the genre of fantasy, there are really only two that could possibly surpass him, Robert E. Howard and J.R.R. Tolkien. And while Moorcock evidently didn't think much of Tolkien, although this attitude has mellowed out in later years, he was always a fan of Howard's writing, and indeed Elric was the result of someone asking him to write a Conan-esque story. But rather than simply create a knockoff of Howard's famous barbarian, Moorcock used Conan as a blueprint to create Elric as the deliberate inversion of Conan. Conan is always described as big and burly, mighty of muscle and sinew. He is a white man, but his skin has been burnt bronze by years of sun and wind. He is always described as having a shoulder-length mane of square-cut black hair and volcanic blue eyes. Elric, though tall himself, is a thin, waifish albino. His skin and hair are often likened to milk or bleached bones, and his eyes are always described as crimson and moody. Conan is a warrior, possessed of great strength and seeming superhuman vitality. Elric's health is so deficient that without magical potions or the strength given by his soul-sucking rune blade, he wouldn't be able to so much as stand up. Conan mistrusts and dislikes magic. Elric is a full-blown sorcerer, though generally he too relies mostly on his battle skill and his sword. Conan is a man of great passion and lust for life. He laughs loudly, fights enthusiastically, and rages fearsomely. He has his brooding moments, to be sure, but he savors life. Every single moment is to be enjoyed. Elric, by contrast, is forever angst-ridden and melancholy, especially after the events of the Dreaming City. Conan is a born adventurer. He doesn't think much of the future and almost never about the past. All that matters is now, the next adventure, the next fight, the next score, the next woman. Elric's past torments him to the point where he often has nightmares about it, and goes through life sensing that his future hangs over him like a sword of Damocles, a terrible doom that could befall him at any moment. Conan begins life as a Cimmerian, a race of backwards barbarians from the north, and ends his story as a king, 
the king of Aquilonia, one of the mightiest nations of the Hyborian Age. Elric began life as the hereditary emperor of the once mighty empire of Melnibene, but apart from the whole eternal champion thing, he ultimately becomes little more than a sellsword. Really, the only thing these two characters have in common is that neither seems to have any difficulty finding his way into the beds of beautiful women. Like most sorcerer nobles of Melnibene, most of Elric's education came in dreams. Imrir is named the Dreaming City, and this is because, through special rites and special alchemies, the sorcerers of Melnibene would essentially educate themselves through dreaming. Elric would project his astral self not only across the world, but through the planes of the multiverse, garnering lifetimes of knowledge in a single day of sleep. He almost never remembered the exact experiences themselves upon wakening, but the knowledge he had obtained in those experiences would be there, implanted in his subconscious, there to be called upon when needed. It's never said, but is certainly not hard to imagine, that Elric saw his dream education as a kind of escape from his overbearing father and his hatred. Elric's life was always going to be a lonely one, one with very few friends. He had no mother, his own father despised him, and his closest relative, Irkun, his cousin, often schemed against him, wishing to take the ruby throne from his sickly cousin for himself. Only three beings in all of Melnibene could Elric have considered friends. Tangle Bones, his twisted but faithful manservant, his very, very distant cousin, Divim Tavar, master of the Dragon Caves, and Cimmeril, the sister of Irkun, who loved Elric and was loved by him in return. When not in pursuit of his sorceress education, in part because his sickly, feeble nature prevented him from taking part in the more physical activities of the Melnibonean aristocracy, Elric spent most of his waking hours in reading and the study of books. This eventually led him to the concept of philosophy, something that most Melnibonaeans had dispensed with generations ago. And in turn, it led him to something that very few Melnibonaeans, indeed almost none, had ever had since the day they had sworn allegiance to Ariok. Morality. This, more than anything else, is what the Melnibonaean people found so disturbing and confusing about their new emperor. Even Cimmeril, who genuinely loved Elric, never could quite understand his strange obsession with concepts such as justice or right and wrong, or trying to have reasons to justify one's actions. Melnibonaeans hadn't needed justification in 10,000 years. They did what they did, whether it be conquer the world, torture slaves, perform magic, indulge whatever vices they liked, simply because they could. This was not enough for Elric. He looked upon the power, even diminished power, knowledge and majesty of Melnibone, and believed that such power should be used not for self-indulgence, but to make the world a better place. Thus, he was perhaps that most foreign of concepts to a Melnibonean, an idealist. It also only served to reinforce the supposition of many, such as Irkun, that Elric was not fit to rule the Bright Empire. But Irkun hated Elric not simply because he wanted his throne, he hated Elric because he wanted Cimmeril for himself, and she would have none of her brother. And so, without going too much into spoilers, one time, Irkun attempted to usurp Elric and kidnap Cimmeril for himself. In the end, the albino emperor triumphed, in the process obtaining his famous runeblade Stormbringer. It was then, however, at the moment of his greatest triumph, where Elric made his greatest mistake. He not only spared the life of his treacherous, weaselly cousin, but, now convinced that by besting him, Irkun had been forced to accept his supremacy, Elric decided to temporarily leave Melnibene, wishing to explore the world of the Young Kingdoms, gain a better understanding of how they ruled their societies, and whether or not he could use that knowledge to improve Melnibene and make it the better, more moral empire he envisioned. What's worse, he decided to leave Irkun in charge as regent. Cimmeril protested that this could only bring about Elric's own destruction, the albino emperor would not listen. And in the end, Cimmeril could not bring herself to leave Melnibene and accompany him in his temporary exile. And so Elric left to wander the world, 
He did indeed learn many things, some good, and a good deal of bad as well. He also discovered in the course of his travels that with Stormbringer at his side, he no longer needed potions or alchemy to sustain his waning strength. So long as there were enemies to kill, the sword would feed upon the souls of those whom Elric slew and transfer their strength and vitality to him. A more sinister discovery was that while Stormbringer had no trouble absorbing the souls of Elric's enemies, it seemed to take a special delight in absorbing the souls of Elric's friends. The sword might suddenly twist about in his grip and plunge deep into the heart of whatever innocent companion was standing near him. But compared to potions, the sword was just too convenient, and so Elric could never quite bring himself to part with it. Back in Melnibone, Irkun used his newfound regency to seize power for himself and declare Elric an outlaw. He also attempted to claim Cimmeril for himself, ugh, but she refused, and so he placed her in a sorceress slumber. If he couldn't have her, he would make certain that Elric could not either. Vengeance took flame in the heart of the man known to many as the White Wolf. Elric was hell-bent on retaking Melnibone and reclaiming Cimmeril, freeing her from her sorceress slumber. So obsessed with vengeance did he become that he was determined that he would have Cimmeril back at any price, even if that price was the destruction of Melnibone and Imrir itself. To this end, he made alliances with many of the young kingdoms. As emperor, he knew the secrets of the magical stone maze that guarded Imrir from all naval assault. He offered to guide their fleets through the maze so that they could plunder Imrir to their heart's content. In return for letting them sack his ancestral capital, Elric would have his chance at vengeance, slay Irkun once and for all, and recover Cimmeril. The city was indeed sacked, many Melnibonaeans were indeed put to the sword, and the men of the Young Kingdoms came away with a lot of loot. Elric did indeed finally take vengeance upon Irkun, slaying him with Stormbringer in single combat. But that's where the good news ended. During the battle between the two cousins, Cimmeril managed to awaken from her ensorcelled slumber, and in his final dying moments, Irkun flung his sister forward so that she died on the point of Stormbringer. Thus, Elric would be known not only as Kinslayer, but Woman Slayer. Then, as the fleet of invaders attempted to escape with their loot, the surviving Melnibonaeans in their rage aroused the fawn from the dragon caves and pursued them. Every single ship of that fleet was burnt to the waterline and its remains sent into the depths. Only one small ship survived, the one that carried Elric himself, for he used a wind spell that was only strong enough to save himself and the vessel he was on. And that was that. Melnibone the Bright Empire was irretrievably lost that day. Its survivors scattered to the winds, reduced to little more than mercenaries just like their former emperor. The only reason that they didn't hunt Elric down and slowly torture him to death was the fact that they knew how his killing of Cimmeril, however accidentally, had destroyed their former emperor. That torment alone was greater than any suffering they themselves could inflict upon him. The White Wolf found no sympathy among the Young Kingdoms either. Many good men and even many kings had gone on that expedition to sack Imrir, and nearly all of them had died by dragonfire. It didn't take long for the rumors to spread that Elric had set up both sides to destroy one another, that he had betrayed the men of the Young Kingdoms who had sacked Imrir just as thoroughly as he had betrayed his own people. All that was left to Elric now was his anguish over the death of Cimmeril and Stormbringer, the instrument of her destruction. He attempted to discard the rune blade, but in the end, he was too dependent on it, like a drug addict. Without the sorceress strength that it gave him, he could barely walk. What's more, it was clear to him that somehow, some way, fate had bonded him and Stormbringer together. They were both parts of the same thing. One could not be without the other. Thus was Elric's fate, to wander and to suffer. Friendship would be rare at best, love and affection almost non-existent. All that would be truly left to him would be the Hell Sword strapped to his back. And somehow he knew even then that it would be his doom to carry that blade 
until he and it had finally served some mysterious and grim purpose, and that he would never understand what that purpose was, even at the very end. And that is Elric of Melnibone. Special thanks to subscribers The Soul of the Dragon for voting for this on Subscribestar. See? Voting does matter, people, so join up.